Agajanian Quinn, a member of the California Arts Council and Beverly Hills Arts Commission, is the former West Coast editor of Andy Warhol's Interview Magazine and society editor of the Herald Examiner. Her cover stories can be read in Venice and Detour magazines, and she is a contributing editor to California Apparel News. For the next half hour, Joan will bring you inside news and views on society, art, film, and the exhilarating worlds of these multifaceted people. Here is Joan Quinn. Hi, welcome to Joan Quinn, etc. I'm Joan Quinn, and we're happy to have you watching us today. Our guests are actress Catherine Helmond and collector designer Connie Parenti. Everyone knows actress Catherine Helmond for her role in ABC's controversial series, Soap. She won a Golden Globe. After that series, she starred in Who's the Boss with Tony Danza. She again won a Golden Globe. Catherine's been nominated for five Emmys. She's, ex she's achieved success in all areas of the entertainment industry. She's directed, she's written, and she's been in feature films. I still remember that image of her face in Brazil, <laughs> Terry Gilliam's uh, award-winning movie. She's a five-foot bundle of Texas dynamite, and we're happy to have her with us. Thank you. Nice <laughs> How do you keep so motivated? Well, I think <coughs> I don't even have to think about motivation because I'm very fortunate in that I love the work I do. I think that's a gift from the gods to be able to do work that you are in love with. And as a kid, I was um, one of those very shy children, you know, that was always hiding, hiding behind doors. My grandmother used to say, that kid's really creepy. It doesn't seem like <laughs> that. <laughs> and then I went to Catholic school. And in Catholic school, they don't ask your opinions, and there's no democratic vote as to what you yes. want to do. You do what you're told to do. Right. And uh, so usually if they put you in a play, they say, okay, you're the elephant this week. <laughs> when I nod, you stand up, you be the elephant. When I nod, you sit down and shut up. So the first time I got on stage, I was just terrified, just terrified. But the nod came, and I got up, and I was the elephant. The mouse became an elephant, and I thought, how wonderful I was an elephant and I think as a child I fell in love with being on the stage and uh, I'm fortunate in the romance has never ended. So your career actually started in Texas. Yes. <laughs> and it's coming uh, full circle because you just got an award from Women in Film, mm -hmm. the Topaz Award. Yes. And when you went to pick it up in, in, I don't know, what city was Dallas. it? In Dallas. Yes. Were there people there who were involved in your career in the very beginning? Uh, well, yes, of course. I think the most uh, important uh, group that was there that involved with my career was my family, uh. who all said, uh, you know, when I first started out, but how in the world are you ever going to work in movies or on the stage? <laughs> A little <laughs> tiny girl like you that's shy, and well, who's going <coughs> to give you a job, you know? But I just, I had a dream, and also I had a summer stock theater with a group of Texans one year, and my family all came up. I had to recruit them. So my dad did the electrics, my mother did the sewing, oh. and my grandmother did the cooking, and my sisters were ushers. And uh, at the end of that summer, my mother said to me, well, I guess you are an actress, because when I see you on stage, my little girl disappears. That's fabulous. And so I thought, well, maybe I can do it. <laughs> what a great uh, compliment. Yes. And coming from your mother, that meant probably everything. Yes. Be that was your motivation. <laughs> Absolutely, because uh, my mother's <coughs> uh, advice was to stay home, marry a nice guy, have a few children, and work in community theater <laughs> and forget about the rest. Well, you went on and did everything. You married a nice guy. <laughs> you, went, you You left community theater and brought happiness to all of us. I hope and so. And we thank you. Um, soap was controversial. Was it your role or was it the actual uh, well, series? It, the whole series uh, was, <coughs> I suppose, mainly because we went into areas that had never been explored in television, especially in sitcom. Now we seem pale compared to what you see on television and even in daytime soaps. But it was the first time that there was what was called a nice married lady who had an extramarital affair, so that was considered very shocking. What year was that, Catherine? Well, we did, um, 
1977, we did the pilot. Oh, so it did go back. It was a forerunner of yes. things to come. It seems like it was not too long ago, but no. it really has been a number of years ago. Also, <laughs> we had a, a homosexual character in the show, and that was the first time I think um, a character that is homosexual was presented in a way as to just be a, a member of the family and uh, a person that everybody uh, functioned with and was involved with on every level. And it was a character that wasn't held up for fun. So all, that was uh, wonderful, all yeah, these breakthroughs, It was quite wonderful, really. really. And I, not to pat myself on the back, but I <coughs> do think that it was an exceptional group of actors. And I think that's been borne out by the fact that uh, so many of the actors from that show who had never done a series before and some never done TV before uh, went on to have really very healthy careers. With all the reruns of that show, um, do you think some of those issues, because they were so much in the forefront, then took on um, kind of a comic element? Yes, I do. Do you think it yes. changed? I think it did change. Because <laughs> uh, it, it was quite serious when you started doing yes. it. I think it did change, but I, when you're the forerunner of something in any arena that you work in, I think it always comes under scrutiny and people take <laughs> it very seriously. And then 10 years later, uh, you see young people, they say, well, what was all the fuss about? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. When I said you were coming on the show, um, people said, is she bringing Tony Danza? <laughs> Do you ever make appearances together? Uh, <coughs> we. We did make appearances together to promote Who's the Boss, of course. The two of us are very busy, but we're doing something more important for the two of us, I hope, than appearing together. Uh, we're working on putting together a TV series. Oh, so it'll be a future yes, project? Yes, uh -huh. uh -huh. Oh, so you are. You the, People are not wrong when they say, where's Tony, where's Catherine? <laughs> <laughs> well, we were very great uh, friends, and we were good working partners, mm. and our friendship blossomed considerably. We work very well together. That's and important. so when our show was just about to be over, we went off to lunch together, and he said, so uh, what do you say? Shall we shake hands and try it again? And I said, let's do it. Oh, that, that was sweet. Mm -hmm. That was great. In 1983, you were accepted um, by the American Film Institute mm -hmm. Women Directors yes. uh, Project. And I know the prerequisite for that is f uh, women who have achieved success in many, many fields. And I think since you were writing and acting and um, I guess doing a lot of other things, that had you been directing at that time? I had not. So this was but like your I foray think into directing? It was indeed. <coughs> but I had the two great advantages. And I have to say, this was a forum for women. Uh, and the money was raised in a workshop forum to have women step into directing. But in my particular case, I was <coughs> tremendously helped by men. Jay Sandridge, who had been directing Soap, invited me to come into the booth and watch and to listen and to learn. And he taught me a great deal. And then I was saying, you know, in that kind of offhand way you do sometimes, one of these days I would like to direct. Well. One day, my husband was looking at the AFI magazine, and he said, look, here's an opportunity for you to direct. Oh. And I said, oh, oh my gosh. Uh, well, uh, 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 everything's going to be over in a week. They're, they're finishing accepting people, you know. And he said, well, OK, go and get the forms and fill them out. And then I came back home, and I said, gosh, you have to have people recommend you. And he said, I think you could call a few people, and they might do that. And indeed, they did. And I had no technical training. Oh, that's but what it was, the I technical? Had, yes. <laughs> but I had had a lot of experience in working with actors. And I had taught acting. So I, m oh. my area that I was able to bring to it was communication with actors. Many of the other women had not done that, but they were technically trained in editing and camera work and everything. Were there well-known women in your group? Uh, no. I think I was the only kind of uh, visible, visible person, saying that uh, in the sense that uh, people knew me as an actor. The rest of the women were mainly women that had made documentaries and uh, also had worked in technical areas. And so I didn't even have a script. They all had scripts. And um, my husband 
uh, wrote a script for me, and he helped me produce it. And I really have to say, without his energy and support, I don't know how I would have gotten through it. But uh, so it was a very hands-on project. Very much so, and the AFI supported that. That was something that they liked about the two of us, that we were going to do it as a unit. And then when you came out of that program, you actually started directing. I did. A few se uh, segments, I yes. guess. Yes. You get to have <coughs> uh, a screening night. And it's really very lovely because you invite people and they set up the whole auditorium to screen your film. And you usually have like a buffet with it. It's really very pleasant. And from that night, I got uh, an offer to direct Benson. Oh, and yes. so from <laughs> then on, I was, it was kind of like a stepping stone to me. And uh, I probably would have done more directing after that if I hadn't suddenly started working so much as an actor. So it, it's very difficult to balance the acting and the directing. Would you think of going into directing? Oh, I think full time. I think probably one day I will. Yes, I think I probably will. What do you think the most important factor of directing is? I suppose is to be organized. <laughs> if you are a person that can stay organized, it means that you can stay on top of things and you can learn the technical stuff as you go along. Uh, another ingredient is I think you have to have the ability to communicate with the actors. That's what I thought that you would say, that rapport with the actors and yes. having them um, but believe you, in you. Absolutely, you have to have that trust and that ability to communicate with them and to help them believe in themselves. Mm. But you also have to be very organized and have uh, a respect for the technical aspect of it. You have to stay in time, in budget, and you have to listen to your technical people to say what can be done and what can, can't be done. I see. Well, same thing happens uh, when you're on the stage. And after you took that workshop, you went on back to the stage I in did. San Francisco. <laughs> yes. And, and worked there. Mm -hmm. And then you went to the Pasadena Playhouse and did a one-woman show. Yes. How could you do that? Be on the well, stage all alone. <laughs> I had always said, it was sort of like that thing of saying, one of these days I'd like to direct. <laughs> I had also said, one of these days I'd like to try the challenge of a one-person show. Now, this is where my ego got the best of me, because I had been so many years working on the stage and working in TV and film and directing, and I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> but from the day I said I could do the script until opening night was four weeks. Is that right? And it was Sarah Bernhardt. Yes. And, who, and, and it was all written. You didn't yes. have to. And now, this is where I... I really didn't have any knowledge of what I was going into. I didn't realize that the material itself had to be totally finished, totally cut into the given amount of time so that in four weeks you didn't start working on the piece of material, the writing. You didn't start trying to cut down three hours of material into an hour and a half. You started at an hour and a half and had to rehearse Yes, you should, you should be <laughs> there. The script should be in time when you start on it. You shouldn't have three hours worth of material that you're trying to I put see. into shape. But uh, I didn't realize that. But it was a lesson well learned. I'll never do that again. It's very tough, isn't oh, it? Being it is on tough. stage. How do you remember all that? How long was it, 90 minutes or yes. something like that? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, one of the things that helps is that I was right in the middle of also working. Uh, uh, who's the boss? That helps. S it helps because <laughs> every single day you're using your memory. In other words, the, uh, the motor's already going and warmed uh -huh. up okay. and you just move into stretching it just a little bit further. Uh -huh. If I hadn't been on stage in years or I hadn't had a job, say, in a year or six months, I might have been thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to learn all of this? But I stepped out of on a Friday night, I did a TV show that I'd been doing all year. And on the next day, on Saturday, I went for a read-through. And so it was uh, very tough. One thing I noticed in your bio was that you were in uh, the House of Blue Leaves. Yes. John Guar's uh, 
John Boris play yes. in 71, and then it was revived again just yes. recently. Yes, it was. <coughs> and we did it uh, off-Broadway, and I guess it just won every award, all the <laughs> actors and all the directors and everything. And it was the start of a, a real big move for him and a very big move for me because actually one of the reasons I was considered for soap was because the person that directed, Jay Sandrich, had seen me do oh. House of Blue Leaves. Oh. So he knew that I could play comedy and tragedy and that I could make that leap from the ridiculous to the serious. Oh, I see. And that's how I got considered for such a big role, never having done a television oh, series. That was great. Mm -hmm. We have to take a big leap too because we have to leave right now. <laughs> but I, one thing I wanted to mention is I know you and David have a production company called Torcan. Yes. Is it? I thought that was very smart of me to figure out one's a Taurus and one's a Cancer. That's right. Was that yes. Right? <laughs> very smart of you. <laughs> and I think we have to say goodbye to our friends Rita Pinus and David Hockney. Absolutely. And to David Christian, your wonderful husband. My dear husband who helps me all the time. And Thank you so much for being with us on Joan Quinn, etc. My pleasure. Bye, Catherine. Hi, welcome back. Uh, I'm Joan Quinn, and that was a picture of Catherine Hellman from Detour Magazine. Catherine was in um, a series of fashion shots, and the jewelry that was uh, provided for those fashion shots were provided by Connie Parenti, our guest today. Connie's a collector. She's been collecting vintage jewelry and clothes for years. She came to Los Angeles in 1969 from St. Louis after a year of school at Washington University of Fine Arts. She decided as a teenager that she would come to California and take over fashion design. <laughs> but her Los Angeles adventure wasn't quite the way she had planned. Um, it was a mess, she said, and she was a mess for 10 years, <laughs> she told me, a real mess. But besides that, she got started somehow and was attracted to vintage clothes and uh, attracted to the wrong kind of guys, huh, Connie? Exactly. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about what the right guy would be. What the right guy would be? Well, he'd have to be someone who was interested in the same kind of things I was because I'm totally dedicated to my work. My, my love, my hobby became my work because of that. I'm obsessed with it. Well, how did you start collecting this? How did you get interested in it? I honestly started when I was a small child. My mother's friends, who were debutantes in the 20s, used to give me things to play with when I was little and I loved them. I was always fascinated with old things. I was fascinated with old movies. Even the little rascals. You know, <laughs> anything Betty Boop was my favorite cartoon. I mean, I, I truly was a reincarnation. And when my mom used to take me to Famous Bar, my favorite place to go was the estate jewelry section. Mm -hmm. And I would go and plop myself down and I'd ask a million questions. You know, what is this? Why is it this expensive? When was it made? And that started my early education. And then in the 60s, when Sgt. Pepper's got really popular, I started going to the Goodwill and the Salvation Army, and I'd find old 20s and 30s dresses. And I'd take them down to Gaslight Square to the proprietors of all the antique stores down there, and I'd trade with them for jewelry, because I didn't have any money, you know, and I'd put things Where on layaway. Where was Gaslight Square? In St. Louis. I see, okay. It was like the Greenwich Village so of St. Louis. So we still in St. Louis yes. before you've even come here. Oh, yeah. This is when I was in high school. Uh-huh. And I'd sneak down there after school, you know, I'd take the bus down there with my little bag of goodies, <laughs> and I'd barter with these, these old people oh. who ran the antique stores. And that's when I started my collection. And then when I came to California, I was working in a boutique called Bazaar CM, mm -hmm. and they carried some new and some old. And I met a lot of my clients through that store because I would, you know, I had a lot of celebrities as clients, and they always wanted what I was wearing. And I never had enough money to run to the flea market to buy more <laughs> stuff. So that's how I started selling it. I would call them and say, you know, remember that bracelet you loved? Would you like to buy it? 
So you and just started just like piece by piece? Right, piece by piece. I mean, I had nothing. I had like maybe six pieces when I started. And did, are any of the things here today pieces that you had from that period? Um, because I know everything here is your own private collection. Yeah, most of it. Um, these, I'd say, because these were really, these celluloid bracelets from the 1920s were really the very first thing that I seriously collected. This is what I, I was on the a search bracelets, for. The celluloid bracelets, the one she on, has on her arm right now. These guys. And what is celluloid? Hold it up a little bit. So, there. Okay. Celluloid was a plastic that was created in the, probably like the late 1800s, and they used to make dresser sets and hair ornaments and, oh. and jewelry out of it. It was outlawed because it's very flammable. Oh, is that what happened? Yeah. And then at the same period, they were making Bakelite. Right. The Bakelite came a little later. That was more in the 30s, and that was my second love. Anything plastic. And, and then Bakelite is on the table. The Maybe Bakelite. we can just, you know. These are some of the famous Bakelite polka dot bracelets and bow tie bracelets that everyone is so crazed for now. And these were injection molded. Oh, they look great. Aren't they beautiful? And, and they're how, so strong. What's the strong. difference between the two materials? Well, Bakelite is a much more durable material because it was made with formaldehyde. Oh. And it's very hard. Like, telephones were made out of Bakelite. And it's a really great material. I mean, it can withstand just about anything. So were these and, uh, made by designers, these jewelry? Uh, these pieces? Or were they signed? The Bakelite... Uh, it wasn't signed, but there were certain designers like Martha Sleeper, for example. And there was another company called Artisan. And they did a lot of things for uh, Disney. They did a lot of Disney figural pins and things like that. And then from the plastics, right, well, the plastics then where'd we go? Well, the plastics got harder and harder to find and more and more expensive. And then, like with anything that you love, you brought in your horizons. And that's when I started, you know, piece by piece, I'd pick up a piece of rhinestone jewelry or a piece of silver that fascinated me. And then but I found... But all the time, costume. All we're, the time. We're, we're calling them costume, vintage right. costume. Just right. define that for us so we know what a vintage costume piece is. Well, vintage just delineate, de delineates that it's not modern. It's anything from, you know, the Georgian era through the 1980s, actually. A lot of the designer pieces from the early 80s are collectible now. Um, it was jewelry that was made totally for fantasy out of non-precious metals. I mean, mm -hmm. the most precious it got was gold, filled, or sterling. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it was prices, just for fun. The prices were uh, affordable. Right, for the most part. I mean, there always was expensive costume jewelry in proportion. You know, there was Chanel and Scamparelli, Dior. Did, you know, couturier designers who had jewelry lines, and of course those pieces were more expensive. In the 40s? Well, all Would we say then, in yeah, the 40s? starting from like the late 20s uh, throughout. And, and what was expensive at that time? What would something have cost, say, the Scaparelli bracelet when it was sold? Well, it's funny, I have some old magazines from like 1941, and some of the Trafari and Eisenberg jewelry that I have is in there. And pieces were like, you know, eighteen dollars that now would be three or four hundred. I see if you went to buy them. Right. But well now, no, I mean the collectible value. Collectible, but right. Now they would be, you know, at least a hundred and fifty, a hundred and seventy five if they were being sold as new. But costume jewelry nowadays starts at a much higher Exactly. Price point than exactly. it did, uh, of course, at that time. Right. I and wonder what's going to happen in the future with the modern things when they become vintage, what kind of prices they'll be going for. Well, things now from the 80s are vintage, That's <laughs> aren't true. they? Yes. I mean, they're collectibles. Totally. And, That's right. And 80s. Um, tell us um, uh, how you actually went out. I know you were telling me you'd take your satchel and go out shopping to a lot of stars. Homes, right? Well, I met them through the store. Bizarre the Sam, was that Berta Fisher? Uh, no, no, it was Choi Fong and Masako Fong. Watanabe. Right. It was a great store for its day, very ahead of its time, and that's where I met Diana Ross and Cher and a lot, so many people. I mean, the list is endless, and that's where I met Lois Garner, James Garner's wife, and Shirley Fonda, and they used to invite me over to their homes, and I'd come in with my little bag. And I remember Diana Ross took me to her children's playroom, and she said, you know, is it okay if I dump it out on the table? <laughs> she was so excited. I mean, she had a complete ball. 
and she she bought quite a bit and invited me back. You know, she said whenever I had anything new to give her a call. And that's just sort of how it started. But I mean, I, I certainly didn't get rich from this. This was just sort of like to feed my hobby. Uh -huh. You know, it wasn't really until about the last five or six years that it took off so big that it became a full-time business for me. And then um, d did you make jewelry a lot when you opened right. your shop and it became a full-time business right. you were also designing exactly. jewelry. yes did I you designed. bring anything that you designed um where is it this piece here is the only piece i brought that i made and this piece i designed for an exhibition that i did in tokyo they did they had an exhibition of american artists it was american pop culture and they invited me to come and T did you sign your pieces? No. Tell us the story. I think it's very funny. No. When you were at the flea market recently. Yeah, I find pieces of mine in antique malls and flea markets throughout town. I found a pair of earrings of mine at the Rose Bowl. <laughs> and the guy was telling me that they had been worn by Cher in some show. And he had, he had gotten them. But I find pieces of mine in antique malls and people will try to tell me that they're unsigned Miriam Haskell. Oh, and I said, they're not Miriam Haskell. I made them. You know, it's, it's, it's really, it's flattering. It's very flattering. And well, I, I know you went and you said, ah, burger beads. Right. The first time my darling friend Marco de Gels took me to burger beads, that was the beginning of everything for me. I mean, the inspiration was endless. I walked in and I couldn't consume enough. I mean, my mind went crazy. I just got all these ideas. I went home, locked myself away for weeks, and came up with all these crazy huge earrings and wild designs, and that was the beginning of everything. And that was Burger Beads, yeah. and, and that was your beginning, and this is our end. I'm going to just show you uh, Connie Parenti's layout in Vogue magazine that was done by um, Candy. Candy Pratt, mm -hmm. and thank you for being with well, us. Well, thank you for having and, me. And bringing all of your beautiful jewels. Well, thank you. Goodbye. Thanks for being with Joan Quinn, etc. We'll see you next time.